Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, and welcome to the Digitally Uploaded Podcast, the companion podcast at DigitallyDownloaded.net. My name is Alan, and I am going to be your host for this month, because we are on a monthly schedule now. With me this week is Matt Sainsbury, the editor-in-chief of DigitallyDownloaded.net. Hello, Matt. I'm the very non-political Matt. Hello. He's not political at all. There's no... no if you create something... Me. No, if you create something, Matt, it's not political. In this, in this economy... Art exists in a vacuum, and if you if you make something and you stab people in it, it doesn't say anything about the world around you. It doesn't say anything. What are you talking about? What are you talking about? It's Kill Bill wasn't a commentary. Anyway, um, hello. Also, Harvard. Harvard's here. Hello, hello. I am also not political. Yeah, yeah. This is an extremely unpolitical podcast. Um, yeah. Trent, what do you what do you have to add to this, Trent? Hello, Trent. <laughs> I, I, I'm I'm deeply political. Oh, he's deeply political. Not even a little bit. He's not even the shallow end of the pool. He's deeply <laughs> political. Anyway, we also have a special guest today. Um, the one, Mr. Philip J. Reed, who is the author of Resident Evil. Would you like to say hello, Philip? I would. Yes, hello. But that's that. I like that, Alan. You just said that he's the author of Resident Evil, so it's like he actually wrote the game. I Resident should Evil, which is... <laughs> we can leave it at that. Yeah, that's you know, fine. Philip wrote Resident Evil. <laughs> it's time. He's the most powerful man in the world, and he went back in time into 1996 and wrote Resident Evil. No, Philip, you, you've written a book about Resident Evil, of course. Um, would you like to like give a little bit of a bio about yourself? Yeah, certainly. Um, I do want to emphasize that that was not your mistake. You didn't misspeak. It is just called Resident Evil, so it is a nightmare to find Thank through Google. Clark. But uh, <laughs> <laughs> if you're looking for it and you do Resident Evil Philip J. Reed or Resident Evil Boss Fight Books, that's the publisher, you'll find it just fine. Um, and yeah, as we were talking about a little before we started recording, it's about 95% focused on the the absolute first game, the 1996 release. Um it dips elsewhere into the series and other games and films as necessary, but it's an examination basically of what horror is and how it functions using Resident Evil as kind of the central case study. Fantastic. That's actually really interesting. As like a big RE fan myself, like that is something that I'm really, really, you know, wanting to sort of deeper dive into, especially given the fact that I don't really experience much horror content outside of gaming just because I am a tiny boy and I get very scared. Um, <laughs> that's that's it's pretty okay. much all it is. <laughs> it's okay. The book itself is not that scary, so I think you'll be all right. I can read books. I, <laughs> I think I can. I think I have literacy skills. Maybe. <laughs> uh, um, yeah. So um, we're gonna jump into a bit of a discussion about the games of next month, which I forgot. June, August. <laughs> It's August. It's okay. It's like that sometimes. Yeah, we've got, we've, we've got to go to some music. <laughs> we've, we've got to go to some music first, Alan. You have to go to some music. I know, but I was sort of going to beat around the bush and try and avoid Miku. But Matt, what's the Miku? It's, Hats- it's Hatsune, Hatsune Miku music, and uh, I think we should let the guest choose the track. <laughs> what's your favorite Hatsune Miku song, Philip? Oh yeah, it's so <laughs> it's hard to choose. It is. It's really hard to choose, isn't it? They're all so equal. <laughs> They're all just. Oh, it's something. <laughs> I'm um, surprised we'll, Matt we'll, didn't get him to pre-prepare one. <laughs> we'll, we'll we'll go with Romeo and Cinderella. That there we go. That's a nice easy one. So we'll go with that. We'll come back and we'll talk about the games of August. Can I just make it clear how much I hate that title? <laughs> it frustrates me so much. Make that perfectly clear every week, every month. We do this now. Yeah, it's. I, There's not been a title that you've liked, Alan. No, I've, I liked the um the the one that was like Sakura. That was good. <laughs> Simbon Sakura. <laughs> yeah, that one. That was alright. That didn't suck. <laughs> <laughs>
and welcome back from all that. So, of course, as we are entering a new month, um, we need to go over the games coming out next month as well, which is very exciting. Um, August, I don't know. I, I've never really thought about August as a month of game releases, but it's, you know, there might be something in there for us. Matt, would you take us away with your information? Yeah, I don't think there's that much for you, to be honest, Alan. Um, Good, there's okay. A... See <laughs> There's some there's some good Japanese games coming or some interesting ones anyway, but I don't know if there's much much for you to be honest. Um, but there is games. So August four on the Switch. We'll look at the Switch first. August four brings us Scully, which is actually a charming looking little indie game thing. Um, well, yeah, go and search that one up if you um, want to see the indie games. Um, I'm just scrolling through the list here. There's not much at the start of the month. That's why I mentioned Scully. <laughs> um, August 11 brings... <laughs> somebody close Alan's ears before he actually has a reaction to this. Uh, August 11 brings Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls in a Dungeon? In I want to die. Infinite Combat. <laughs> I want to die. Um, <laughs> isn't that just Konosuba or am I wrong? That's an anime, isn't it, as well? Cause it is I, an anime. Yeah, I've heard the that game, and it made me very upset. <laughs> it, I, I believe it's um i, I want to say it's like a, a roguelike thing from spectrum soft that's what i think it is it, it is a dungeon it, it's some kind of jrpg anyway but uh yeah, yeah i think it is a roguelike like in the mystery dungeon mold but it comes to us from, from spectrum soft and they know their stuff so that's that's well worth looking forward to on august 12 banner of the maid comes out on switch as well it's already out on pc but the console version would be the way to play it i imagine um, that is the tactics JRPG game that's based on the Napoleonic era, where you play as Napoleon's sister going around and killing dudes all across France. Um, Wearing it's clothing quite good. that is not exactly appropriate for killing dudes all across France, I'm going to say. Not entirely appropriate, but very aesthetically <laughs> pleasing. <laughs> all righty. That's a tagline there, everyone. <laughs> but actually, I, ha I I did play the PC game, and it does have a, a pretty dodgy translation. Unfortunately, it is a Chinese-developed game, and they didn't hire a particularly good translator. But the game itself is actually really good. The tactics in it is, is really good. So if you like Final Fantasy tactics and all that stuff, you will like Banner of the Maid, I think. See, that's what um, frustrates me, is that that game sounds like my jam, except for pretty much everything about the aesthetic. <laughs> I think I think you'll be able to move past the aesthetic to enjoy it still, Alan. Will I? You, yeah, I think you so. Know me. I gen <laughs> no, I genuinely think so. I think you can actually focus on the tactics enough that you don't need to. You can kind of now, Matt, turn away, Matt, turn away from have, the other scenes. Does it have a snowball scene? You know how I like. I, I'm not thinking at Last of Us. I'm. I like. Does that, you know, like the the how I like uh, on Final Fantasy, the tactics of. And what you're talking about. It's yeah. got the snowball scene. Does it yeah. have one of those? Like that good entry, that good tutorial. Yeah. I, I just, shit. Live on. Live Trent, <laughs> Trent, I don't think I don't think there's a week that's gone by in the last two years that you haven't mentioned the snowball fight scene at the start of Final Fantasy Tactics Advance. As, the other uh, good part of Final think... Fantasy. <laughs> It is true to watch a child just get absolutely the shit kicked out of him in the beginning of the Game Boy Advance game. <laughs> Mo moving on, Collar, Collar X Malice comes out on Switch on August 13, <laughs> a visual novel which is particularly well regarded, um, and I think that it'll be good on Switch because Switch is good for, the, um, for visual novels. Moving on, um, Faeria comes out on August 13, I don't know what that is. It's just got an interesting name. Um, <laughs> it does uh, sound like one of those games that Trent or Harvard or myself could make up. <laughs> it's close uh, enough. Speaking of visual novels, Ao Kanna for Rhythms Across the Blue comes out on August 21 as well. That's another game that is most certainly not for Alan, but... <laughs> I was going to say, lot of, that, that lot of, sounds uh, like the least me thing in the world. A lot of other people will enjoy it. And on August 21, and this is going to sound, I guess, weird coming from me, but PGA Tour 2K21 comes out on Switch. And I'm actually looking forward to that because I do think that golfing on the go is the way to go. Um, and, yeah, a good, a good quality golf sim on my Switch would be something that I would quite enjoy, I think. Um, August 25, Giraffe and Anika. 
comes out on Switch. Already available on PC. This is a rhythm game, 3D platformer thing, which actually looks really charming, very bright, very colourful, very happy. I think that'll be quite good. And then August 24 brings, sorry, August 27 brings Final Fantasy Crystal, Crystal Chronicles Remastered Edition. Oh, yeah. Which should yeah. be good. I have, yeah. I have very... I have very fond memories of playing that as a kid on the GameCube, and I'm very much looking forward to that again. With you. I'm so like excited to make someone carry the bucket. I'm so excited. I'm so excited. I've never played that one. I am definitely interested. I'm glad to hear everybody reacting uh, with such overwhelming positivity because I would like to check it out. Unless the... they've done. Sorry. Unless they've, unless they've done something absolutely massive with the game, it's going to suck in single player because the original was terrible as a single player game. But as multiplayer, uh, it is a lot of fun. Like that, a huh. lot, a lot of fun. That was the one that you had to have like four Game Boy Advances to play, right? Yeah. You didn't have four, to, but four you could connect to a GameCube. That is just such a high level of entry. Like I'm surprised <laughs> they even released that game to begin with. That is well, we actually, I actually. We actually did that because the, I have two brothers and um, a friend, and we all had GBAs, and we actually did get all the link cables. And we did play the game full in through on the dual screen experience, and it was a lot of fun. But yeah, very high barrier to entry. That won't be the case with this one, obviously, and it will have online multi multiplayer. So we'll be able to so get crews better. together and play and have a good time. I am genuinely looking forward to that. I think that's going to be a lovely little game. Um, just finishing out on the Switch for the month, Immortal Realms Vampire... Vampire Wars comes out on August 28. I have a vague impression that I've actually seen something about that game and it looks pretty good. So, you know, vampires and stuff is good. Uh, August 28 also brings Nexomon Extinction, which is a Pokemon clone, but it's actually a good looking one. Um, P Cube's, pub P -Cube's I... publishing it and it looks like it's a kind of Pokemon red and blue throwback. Like, they're trying to be very classical about the... Nexomon the sounds like the black and gold brand. Of it does, doesn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's, like, it's like... like you go but, and you try to buy jelly and the jelly doesn't set properly. But it's but seriously, instead. Go, but seriously, go and, uh, go and search it up because it actually does look better than it sounds, like, from the title. That's what they and then Black and gold jelly as well. <laughs> and then finally, for the Switch... August 28, Captain Tsubasa, Rise of the New Champions. That's the anime soccer game, which, I don't know. It's a it's it's an anime tie-in, so it could be bad, because it does come from Bandai Namco, but sometimes they're good as well. So, that, yeah. That is actually on my radar. I have never played any of the games. The soundtracks, from what I've heard, the soundtracks are phenomenal. Um, and what was the other one? Inazuma 11. That one we did get, I think, last generation or something for the 3DS, and I really enjoyed that. And I know it's a different series, but I'm, I'm just I'm getting my hopes up that this will scratch that same itch. I hope it does. Yeah, I was a big time fan of Inazuma 11. Um, so yeah, I think that's probably why I'm also interested in this one because, likewise, anime soccer game. But yeah, we'll have to see how that plays out. I I'm cautiously optimistic that'll be quite good. It's Moving also over... published by Level Five as well, so I have infinite trust that that's actually like a good game. In the Zoomer 11 is, but um, this one's not. It's not? Okay, well then Cap everything's ruined. Cap <laughs> Cap <laughs> Captain Subasa is, is a Bandai Namco thing, so... Ugh. I mean, they've done plenty of good Tekken. stuff as well, but... They made Tekken. Tekken's pretty cool. Yeah, they know their stuff sometimes. So moving <laughs> over to the PlayStation 4, um, Fast, Fast and Furious Crossroads comes out on August Oh, hell 7. yeah, brother. I am, I am morbidly interested in this game. <laughs> I just, I think it's going to be an absolute train wreck, but that's what I want what as well. Time? I want it to be terrible. No, it's going to be amazing. What are you talking about? Diesel's going to come, he's going to punch you in the mouth. It's going to be great. <laughs> that's so fucking sick. <laughs> I, I, I'm morbidly interested in it. Uh, let's put it that way. Moving on. Fast <laughs> uh, <laughs> the Furious Part Two. <laughs> it's the revenge so, story. <laughs> is it is it wrong to try to pick up girls in a dungeon? Also comes out on PlayStation Four. So does Banner of the Maid. Um, there is also a game called Pathfinder Kingmaker coming out on August 18, and that is going to be great. That is a. That's basically. There's a lot of history behind it, which I won't get into in the podcast, but that's a split off of Dungeons and Dragons. Um, and it's what a they did. Baldur's Gate. It is a Baldur's Gate like game with a different franchise with a different. Uh, but it, it is that same heritage. So I'm looking forward to that because I do like Baldur's Gate. Um, 
There's also PGA Tour, of course, coming on on the PS4. Giraffe and Anika is also coming on PS4. Death End Request 2 comes out on PS4 on August 25. That is a horror-themed niche JRPG by Idea Factory. But the first one was actually genuinely good, so I've got high hopes for this one. I know, again, Alan, not Alan's thing, but if you like your niche... If you're a niche JRPG fan, you are probably looking forward to that. August 25 brings Madden NFL 21, if you like your kickballs. I'm genuinely actually excited for that game. I might buy it. <laughs> That's why, because I figured that you would be. Um, <laughs> yeah. I have to make up the, the like, dude bro quotient. Well, I did, say, I did say that I was looking forward to the golfy game on the Switch, so I know. I know the, I know the appeal of the dude bro. Yeah. Gotta, you gotta um, get in there and, you know, beat up some people. Looking <laughs> <laughs> goal. Yeah. And then for the exact opposite of the dude bro, on August 25, Kadagawa Jet Girls comes out on PlayStation Jesus 4. Jesus Christ. <laughs> that What's is the called? game by the, Kadagawa Jet Girls. That is the game that comes to us from, that's the newest game from the guy that made Senran Kagura. Oh um, God, I love uh, that. Okay. Oh, I can he's it. still at it. <laughs> he's wow. still at it. And he's actually, if anything, <laughs> if anything, if uh, anything, Harvard, this one they're even more inflated. So you know, he's not a, he's not only still at it; he's actually escalating it. They're yeah, poor so bats. What are you? What are you doing in that game? Because what I don't like I about his no recent idea. games is that they're on jet. Like you don't do anything anymore. They used to be good brawlers, and then they suddenly went like, okay, we're just gonna have no gameplay, and you just touch this model of a character for a bit. You know, I I think it's mainly I about mean, what you do after like, the game. <laughs> yeah, no, you. It's it's a one-handed game. <laughs> it's a one-handed game. This is what I get for enjoying games for their gameplay. <laughs> it's it's an experience game, you know, like a walking simulator. It is a strand type game, as we. All know. <laughs> Uh, so quickly, actually, going back, there is one I missed. A Dying Light Hell Raid comes out on August 14, and I'm actually looking forward to that. Um, Dying Wait. Light was that zombie game. Yeah. But Hell Raid was their kind of Hexen-like, heretic-like, kind of gothic horror, lots of skeletons, first-person shooter thing that they were making. They dumped that, and they've made it a oh, DLC for Dying Light instead. That's so wild. I forgot about that entirely. Yeah, it's actually looking really good. I'm actually genuinely looking forward to this thing um, because I like gothic horror. I like Hexen and Heretic, and this game looks like it does justice to all that heritage. So, yeah, look out for that on August 14. Plus, Dying Light is a surprisingly good game. Yeah, it's not bad. It's, it's genuinely not bad. I, I kind of like it. the closest that this generation has got to, like, Left 4 Dead, in my opinion, which is about as high praise I can give a zombie game in this economy. <laughs> Um, the economy. Yeah. So moving back, uh, Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles comes out on PS4 as well, of course. Wasteland 3 comes out on PS4 on August 28. Mm -hmm. So if you like your Fallout, then you're going to like that. Wasteland 2 was really good. I'm sure Wasteland 3 will be equally good. Yes, um, I'm very excited about that one. Yeah, it should be should be great. Immortal Realms and Captain Tsubasa both come out on PlayStation 4 as well. So does Nexomon, so you can get your Pokemon fix on the PS4. And then the last game for the PS4 next month is Project Cars 3, which I'm very much yeah, looking dude. for. I like my Vroom Vrooms, and that's a good Vroom Vroom series. So after after Assetto Corsa and F1 last month, I'm definitely in the mindset to play more Vroom Vroom games. And yeah, I'm pretty yeah. sure that game will deliver. I mean, Project Cars 2, despite having some weird handling stuff and almost no reason, is extremely good. And I really like that game. So to, to be honest, I actually missed Project Cars 2, but I was a huge fan of Project Cars 1. So 2 had some weird stuff, but, you know, it's all right. You walk it off. <laughs> I'll just wait for Forza Motorsport. Yeah. yeah that game's yeah. also good. Okay, yeah. so after all of that, let's jump to the guest. Philip, pick one game. Which game would you play of that of all of those ones that we've been talking about, which one is the one that kind of stands out for you as the most interesting? Ah, without any doubt, it's Wasteland 3. I can um, mm. I can point at Captain Tsubasa. You know, that's another one if I really need to reach and say I'm looking forward to that. But Wasteland 3 has just been on my radar probably since the day <laughs> I played Wasteland 2. So <laughs> I'm very excited to get my hands on it. Cool. Trent, pick one. You get one, not two, I not get, three, I one. <laughs> Just one? <laughs> Just one. Wow. Um, I don't know. What, like, what's, like, 
uh, you said a lot of games, but like, what really is coming out in August? Like, you project know, what Cast really... Three. Just say Project, project Cast Three, Trent. You know, you know, I, I, I'm pretty sure there's going to be some more Animal Crossing DLC, so I'm just going to say that. <laughs> you said that for two months in a row. <laughs> yeah, and, it's, and we've been in lockdown two months in a row, even though I work because I'm essential. But that's, but yeah, like, you know, it's just all about relaxation. You know, catching some fish or whatever you do. There was a diving patch only last month. Maybe we'll finally get the cafe. I don't know. Cool. Oh, okay. <laughs> That's fine, <laughs> <laughs> Just let that silence fall for a bit first. Hey. Um, I'm going to go out and say Final Fantasy Crystal Chronicles. I hope, fingers crossed, that the online is going to be good enough to make it a decent experience because I remember that game you need to be sitting with people it's so much of a it's like a party game mixed with a dungeon crawling RPG right it's like the Mario Kart of Diablo yeah, so I, mean, communication I really hope really to have that experience is it the yeah. Dark Souls of video games no, no. <laughs> but, but for the example there are there are, I mean, one of the main mechanics in the thing and the reason it works kind of, it, it really is a, a multiplayer thing is that to create the more powerful spells, uh, you need to combine with uh, another player. So, for example, if you cast a spell by yourself, it's just fire, but it becomes fire if you combine with somebody else. So some enemies you actually need to, to combine your magic to, to defeat them or some puzzles you need to as well. So, yeah, communication is going to be pretty important for that game, so with the online experience to work but i hope i hope it is good because then we can play the we can get the dd dd net crew together to go adventuring and questing and you don't want me to do that you do not want me to do, do we know if it's gonna be voice chat we don't, don't at the moment. So. nintendo has like a stupid phone app for that right yeah, you can download an app to your phone and you can just like also just call but instead it is, <laughs> you need to call them. You just, it is, you it is call them. It, it is cross play though so you'll be able to play switch and ps4 and pc i think they're all cross play so I it doesn't matter which version you good i sure. cannot explain how much i hate the nintendo online situation i uh, anyway sorry i, ju I just it it sends me into the sun to think that they thought that <laughs> instead of just like putting a microphone into the console or letting you use a microphone in the console you connect your phone where you can just use a fucking phone to call someone you can just use it it has a button it's a phone it has telephone in the name alan Sorry. just pick a game oh, i'm gonna cheat because mechanicus. <laughs> <laughs> mechanicus came out like like a few days ago and i didn't realize it um it's xcom but with warhammer 40k stuff it's pretty cool. You play. Which one? Sorry. It's one of forty thousand Mechanicus. It's. Oh a, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, I had no idea that it came out. I thought it was coming out next month. It turns out it came out three days ago. It's okay. <laughs> so it's really good. What are you talking about? It's like one of my favorite tactics games of the last. Like. Five. I mean, I've been playing it as well. I I kind of like it, but it's just so obsessed with trying to be grim. <laughs> yeah. Like, have you played forty k before? <laughs> Yeah, I know, I know, it, I know. It's all very grim, forty k and stuff. But this one even tries to up the ante on the, on the grim dead stuff. They're, it's they're just dead space mummies, but also they're Egyptian. <laughs> it's great, space Egypt. Look, Alan, I've been saying for the past few podcasts that I've been playing a game from like March. Every time there's like a games of next month like segment, so I'm pretty sure a game like a few days out is probably okay. Yeah, but I'm still, like, not pleased with myself. I know I can do better. <laughs> I, I know I can grow more as a person. <laughs> Matt, what's your game of the month? Is it one of those strange games? Oh, it definitely I is. is I, I'm, definitely, I'm definitely keen on Is It Wrong to Try to Pick Up Girls <laughs> yeah, in a Dungeon? All right, that's okay. And I, I'm pretty keen on it because, like, the box art has a girl with twin tail hair, and that's... What about, what about the, other, <laughs> the, other two that's... the other category, that... the Jet Girls game? What about that? No, I'm not a big fan of the Big Op Eye. You know that. I, I didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> Tell us more about the game you like. You'll learn today. Yeah, the more you know. <laughs> oh my God. No, but uh, in all seriousness, I'm quite interested in roguelikes and Spike Chunsoft as a publisher. They, they never do me wrong. So, yeah, I'm keen to check this one out. It's you know, I'm glad to hear that. Um, we're going to pick some music from Warhammer 40,000 Mechanicus because it has organ drops, and I wanted to bring that up just because of the organ drop. I'm it's not so even kidding. Good. It's so good. The The soundtrack is literally just half, like, mechanical noise, and then the other half is insane organ 
like nonsense and it's a bop. I'd mosh to that. I'm gonna mosh to it right now. You can't stop me. No one can stop me. Welcome back from all of that. So, um, we are going to be talking a little bit about a topic that I think most of us have experience with. By most of us, I mean all of us. <laughs> so I don't know why I'm being so modest about it. Um, but yeah, we're going to talk about uh, what makes a good JRPG, because, you know, there's a lot of different varieties of JRPG that exist currently, um, and... For me personally, I haven't experienced a lot of them. I know that Matt's experienced probably all of them at the same time. Like in the, he's <laughs> he just he knows, and it it frightens me. It scares me. I wake up and I'm doing a cold sweat at night, and I think, oh, Matt's thinking about JRPGs again. <laughs> I don't know what this bit's going to. Anyway, um, so we we all have our different ideas about what makes a good JRPG, um, and it you know it informs the way that we understand things, and obviously with Releases such as Dragon Quest XI S having recently been announced for PC, Xbox One X, and other things potentially, um, it's sort of going to bring you know the the content of what makes a good JRPG back into the spotlight, I guess, especially for a Western audience which has been sort of starved outside of Persona Five and well Dragon Quest XI S basically. Um, so I- I'm going to throw the floor to you right now, actually, Matt, and just you know sort of what do you think makes a good you know, JRPG in a modern context? Um, Twin Tales. All right, well, Harvard, what makes a good <laughs> JRPG in modern context? No, that's but just, seriously. Like uh, two strikes in this section. Yeah, well, that's, that's the end of it. I'm in, I'm, I'm in Alan's naughty books now. Um, What's the one? No, I, <laughs> um, for, for me, I, I, for me, JRPGs are a storytelling thing. Um, mm. Almost entirely... Uh, that doesn't necessarily mean it needs to be a hugely deep story. Uh, Dragon Quest, for example, they don't tend to have intensely deep thematic narratives, but it does need to be a game where basically everything... It does need service. to be a game. This is it just... does need to be a game where everything needs to be in service of uh, the, the narrative. Uh, that needs to be the, the absolute focus. And I think, for me, that's kind of the difference between JRPGs and Western RPGs. Western RPGs are still very orientated towards the gameplay mechanics and the gameplay loops. You look at you know, Mass Effect or uh, Dragon Age or the older ones like um, Baldur's Gate. I'm just listing off Bioware games here. but um... <laughs> listing off the exact same company's stuff. <laughs> <laughs> but other ones as well, like Spiders games, for example, Greedfall and kind of the, the, um, the niche ones as well. Those games are all in service of both storytelling and they have a, a heavy focus as well on the gameplay loops as, uh, as something that's core to the experience. Whereas for me, JRPGs, it doesn't really matter how the game plays. What matters is what story it's telling. And I think that's why I tend to be a little bit more forgiving of JRPGs in terms of if they don't have great combat systems or they don't have great a great focus on the gameplay bits. Um, a good example being the original Nier, not Automata, the first one. 
Um, that game didn't play particularly well, but because what was there was in service of the narrative, I found it very yeah, interesting. I, I think the point behind Nier is the fact that it is so generic that it intentionally throws you off guard right away. Just because you think it is just the most blur game, and then all of a sudden it's like, oh no, there's actually things happening here. It's, it's cool. It's yeah, it took me a while. It's gameplay it, subversion. And, it took me and, a while to get to really kind of click with Nier, but uh, when I realized that it was basically throwing little bits of every type of video game out there at you, uh, like there was a visual novel segment, there was a top down, you know, dual stick shooter segment, there was all kinds of these kind of little quirky side bits of gameplay and it was yeah it, uh, that's when it clicked with me but that took me a couple of hours to get into but yeah I mean, all of that was still in service of the narrative as well so for me yeah that's what makes a jrpg whether it's good or not uh, whether whether i decide I, I like it or not is really dependent on how much i find myself involved in the narrative i guess i i find myself sort of on the opposite side of you in that i think that there are some games that you know, do narrative really well, but the gameplay is just so atrocious that I can't put myself through it. Um, and then there are some games that play really well, but have a story so atrocious that I just want to die. Um, I, I'm going to use an example of Eternal Sonata. I don't know if anyone else has played this game, but I rented this game uh, from Blockbuster Video back in 2009, I think, which is the most, like, millennial thing I've ever done in my life. Um but basically, there, there is a, a extreme amount of cutscenes in that game that are just poorly written and so obtuse. And it, it, it speaks to me like a year 11 student in a creative art class writing out and being like, the poppling brooks blow through the wind as a, as a gust of air brings light to the day. It's that sort of thing. That sort of stuff sends me and I can't deal with it. Um, and that's that's one side of it and then the other side of it is where the the gameplay is so bad that i can't deal with it and that's where i guess something like final fantasy 13 comes into it because i just did not enjoy playing that game combat wise at all and because that is half the game i couldn't push through it um and i know that matt really likes 13 of course but well 13 i mean i didn't think that much of the the gameplay either <laughs> um, yeah, but you could push through that though i could yeah that's exactly i mean that's a good example yeah. of what i'm talking about that what was in there in front of fantasy 13 was definitely in service of the narrative it, i mean it was literally corridors that you walk down yeah, uh, for most of the game <laughs> uh and each of those corridors who was you know bookended by cutscenes that were you know lengthy and, and story driven so yeah that that was a good example i think of, of the i game would that... say quite comfortably that final fantasy 10 is a better version of 13's attempt at mixing those two ideas because the entire point of the, of 10 is this whole pilgrimage and it justifies going on these weird routes and doing this weird snaky journey all across a spira i also played 10 very recently on my stream um and i cried at the end because of course i did because that game hits me in places that just cannot ah it's it's like proper like just fantastic work I love it. You, I you just you got up to the pool scene and um... no, I didn't get up to the pool scene. The pool scene is dumb. It's so <laughs> they, they should be drowning. <laughs> what is it's this? A, Alan, Alan, it's a metaphor of something that's not actually involved. You know, not not it's swimming. Definitely it, not. It's, <laughs> it's they were doing up. Uh, they were doing other things, not swimming. There, Alan. That's <laughs> they were playing mahjong. They yeah, were that's... playing Richie Mahjong. <laughs> that's all they were doing. Matt. Don't, don't even suggest anything else. Tinnitus and Yuna are innocent. <laughs> they don't know what that is. Yeah, see, Final <laughs> Fantasy X, I, I think, is a great game. I really love Final Fantasy X as well. But, um, you know, it, it for me, it's not my favourite Final Fantasy because the, the narrative, I think, it's a very good narrative, and when I say it's not my favorite kind of fantasy, we are talking about a, a series that I pretty much love. University. Yeah, I was going to say like so. Basically, four of your ten top ten games. <laughs> yeah, and Final Fantasy ten would be probably in the top ten JRPGs anyway. It's just not my favorite Final Fantasy because the the narrative for me wasn't didn't quite hit the same notes. And that's just a personal thing. It's just the themes that the game addressed weren't as interesting to me as the themes of say Final Fantasy. 13 um you know the yeah. the religion discussion that goes on in final fantasy 10 is just not as interesting to me as the kind of the um the the themes that uh, the determinism that was kind of the focus of final fantasy 13 that's all um, i guess i guess for me because i was like also titus's laugh was terrible 
No, that, I will fight you on this <laughs> right here. That that it's seems meant laugh. to be uncomfortable and stupid. That's the point. It's a terrible he's, laugh. He's been told his dad is the embodiment of the end of the world. <laughs> what do you want from him? He's a I poor think boy. We actually have a guest on the, the podcast, and I think Philip can, can answer this for us <laughs> definitively. So, Philip, that laugh, was it good or bad? Suzo was uh, it was intentionally bad. I am oh, on, on your side on this one, Matt. I'm sorry. I, damn it, damn I, I have mate. very strong feelings about it. I think it was perfectly executed for what it was supposed to be. But when you remove the context, not that you're doing that, Matt, because I know you have the context, but when people online remove the context, it looks like, oh, terrible early video game voice acting. But that's oh, not absolutely. what it is. It's actually really right. good. So now Alan's head's getting bigger and bigger and bigger. Thanks for that. <laughs> no, it's not my head's getting bigger. I'm just excited I that tried someone else has the tongue. context. <laughs> <laughs> I trust Philip more than I can explain right now. <laughs> He's got the right opinion. <laughs> Speaking of opinions, okay, so Philip, what's your take on what makes a good JRPG? <laughs> Shut <You> know, us up. <laughs> oh, I'd love to. Thank you. Um, <laughs> no, it was uh, a really interesting topic when you mentioned this is what we'd be discussing. And mainly I was interested because I want to know the answer. My experience with JRPGs is, you know, enjoying some and not enjoying some others. And I haven't really thought about it very critically beyond that. But I think from this discussion, I'm realizing story, at least overall, isn't all that important to me. And this is, you know, now you can make fun of me in terms of Final Fantasy X. I don't know yeah, that I yeah, understood dude. the story. I really don't. Like, I would have a really difficult time summarizing what happened with any degree of certainty beyond the broad strokes. However, the character interactions and their dynamics, I could probably sit and talk to you for hours about that and i would also end by crying that is the correct response at the end um so Philip, i think i maybe... want to say right now i i cannot appreciate you more honestly oh yeah this is social distance hug over Skype. Yeah, yeah, um dude. but yeah i i think just listening to the way you guys went back and forth on that maybe to me it's it's the character dynamics that keeps me going more than the story because i'm dumb enough that i don't really get the story well, I mean, that would make sense because we've had lots and lots of talks over Facebook about um, Persona, and whenever we yeah, talk about say, Persona, it's just mm -hmm. the characters. We don't talk about the <laughs> general narrative. Oh, yeah, not at all. We talk, <laughs> we talk, we just talk about the characters, and well, more specifically, we talk about how much better Risa is than Chie. But um, oh, damn it, dude! You do talk uh, about that. Uh, <laughs> no, that's. I think that's really fair because um, I, now I feel less dumb. Because I do think I understand the stories of Persona, but the fact that, you know, you and I have spoken for years now about the series and not ever discussed the story probably makes it pretty clear to me that that's not what's important. Absolutely, though, the, uh, the way the characters are defined and developed and the way that they change, and that's not even necessarily, I don't know, in terms of their arc, you know, the Phantom Thieves go in and change somebody's mind. Okay, that's fine. But it's just as you become more informed of who these people are and were, they, they just feel more realistic as you go on. And yeah, I would absolutely say that's more important to me in a JRPG than, uh, than stories and probably, or even necessarily themes. That's probably where Persona 5 lost me just a little bit. <clears throat> and because the, it was very much about the characters, right? And I have one character that I liked in particular, which was Anne, but I finished her arc pretty pretty much immediately because she's the first one of the first characters you meet and you can max out her rank her, her narrative arc you know very early on i think i had it done by about the 20th hour or whatever and then i had to wade through another 80 hours to get to the end of the game so <laughs> I, I was I, I i think that's where the game lost me a little bit actually i think that's a good point um that definitely a lot of jrpgs are very much focused on that character experience so if they lose that at any point then they do lose their their thrust a little bit yeah yeah if you talk about something like Dragon Quest XI, um, I, I would say that that game is the opposite of that, where I really enjoy those little self-contained stories, but I also hate the party most of the time, because the party is either extremely... <laughs> oh, you just love Silvio. You love Silvio. Silvando, thank you very much. Silvando, whatever. He's the great Silvando. It's, he is the it's great been a while since I last played that game. <laughs> no, so like <laughs> that, that game has just the worst fucking party of any game I've ever played in my I hate all of them. None of them are interesting. It's like horny grandpa. There's like lady who is also a bunny. There's extremely flamboyant man who is pretty cool, to be fair. And there's, there's hero. And hero 
Hero does nothing except shout sometimes, and then he rides a horse, and that's it. Whereas I like Peter's... the girl. I like. I like the girl that you could dress up in the Arabian costume. Oh, which one? So the healer, I think. Oh, no personality, was. McGee. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Her personality she was, was, wow, I can't wait to heal everyone, and you're a white page. <laughs> bit of a rogue play. <laughs> it's, it's almost as if these games benefit from a sort of bondy experience, sometimes with snowballs, um, at the start oh. of the game. Uh, what, do you think about, what do you think about eating up children? Trent, with snowballs. What do you think about that? What are, what are your thoughts? It's just a wholesome experience. <laughs> wow. You gotta do it. You gotta... Sometimes I wonder. Uh, sometimes I wonder if Trent's entire experience of JRPGs is just that opening it's, it's tutorial. Of Final Fantasy Fantasy Fantasy. Fantasy. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I, I played Neo Akimi. I played Persona. I have played other games. Final Fantasy Tactics Advance Two. <laughs> yeah. It's not actually as good as it, the first one, though. No, it's terrible. <laughs> no, it was fine. It was content, but it wasn't like. Yeah, it was content. That's exactly what it yeah. was. Just it was. It was pure well. content. Just play um, but anyway, everyone mute. <laughs> seriously though, Trent, putting aside your love of this unhealthily, uh, unhealthy love of this tutorial, what what is it about a JRPG <laughs> that you think? It, how do you deter, determine if you actually kind of like this JRPG or not? Well, it, I, I guess you know, story is very important. Like, a, like the arc doesn't really need to be overly complicated, but if it's like the like the main overall theme is basically, you know, somewhat interesting, then it definitely grabs my attention. Um, and then I guess the sort of wholesome little experiences throughout the game or the little interactions between the characters sort of helps. Um, sometimes also, I guess, narrative de design in general is also really high in a lot of JRPG games. It's not necessarily um, dialogue or text. It could be something cool or quirky you find um, as a collectible or an interesting design in the level or something like that which uh, relates to the narrative design and then relates to the overall experience. So stuff like that also helps uh, in the game experience. Cool. Excellent. Yeah. That was very concise. Very clean. Did you have that written down or something? No. <laughs> you, just, you just read because <laughs> it was like you were lecturing us. Moving on, Harvard. You just wrote Snowball a thousand times and what you think <laughs> <laughs> uh, For me, I think the, the games that have really uh, made a good impression on me recently have been the ones that recognize that JRPG is usually a really big, long, time-consuming genre and mitigate that to some extent so i have really liked dragon quest 11 and i really liked um cross code and i really liked uh the longest five minutes and i think what each of those games does is that it makes sure you're getting like a little nugget of what you enjoy out of a jrpg so a bit of combat and a bit of character and a bit of story all the way through so you don't play halfway and then lose to a boss and then a year later you come back and you go why am i fighting this giant bear octopus with some people that i don't know because at that moment you're kind of like, do I start over or do I, do I read a guide or? And I think modern JRPGs, the good ones that I enjoy, are the ones that guide you through the experience and recognize how to structure themselves in a reasonable way. <laughs> I'll say that. Yeah, I mean that's a topic we've talked about plenty of, and there are too many JRPGs that are way too long, like Persona Five, for example. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that are just just they ask way too much of their players for what they're actually telling. I mean, a hundred hour JRPG is fine. If you're actually telling a story that's worth a hundred hours worth of play. And there aren't that many that do that. I would say that trails of cold steel does, but um, even then that was split across a couple of different games. So you were still experiencing that in uh, smaller chunks, but yeah, I, I, one of the reasons that I'm a big fan of the Atelier series, for example, is that those games are only about 20 hours to play through. And, um, they recognize that they don't have that big epic story to tell and they just get to the point nice and quick. So yeah, too, too many JRPGs do try to be too ambitious, I think in terms of their scope and that, that is definitely something that is an issue. Yeah. And I genre. hate when someone you're playing a game and someone's recommended it to you and then you say, Oh, I'm like 20 hours in and they're like, Oh yeah, the real game starts now. I think Alan yeah, did that to me with Final Fantasy X. And I'm yeah, just like, so bro, I, it's I been 20 hours. 
have you played the FFTX remaster? Because it actually has a four times speed up mode in it, which means that you don't spend time grinding as much. You can just literally do one grinding session. I did it in Macalania Woods, for example, and the entire game was just like, that's all I need to do. I'm set. Like I went and I did the the ultimate offense stuff and I was done. One session grinding, that was it. It's yeah, all, it's of, the, all way of the to do it. all of the remasters do that actually for all, all the it's modern so versions. Good. So Every Final game Fantasy have that. Final Fantasy seven, eight, nine, and I think twelve as well. The remaster, yeah. I think they all have that speed up mode to I make it a little bit quicker. Well, so like, yeah, that's know, it, it's annoying. That that part of JRPG always annoys me because you spend more time going through stock like canned animations of like i'm gonna show you that i'm casting a scary spell Ooh. and so like, i could i could just win the battle and that's but kind of what i like there, there are some games nowadays that are actually also doing the whole like auto resolve thing which i think is a really good idea because frankly like i don't want to kill rats for like the seventy thousand times <laughs> i've killed enough rats in my life i'm, I'm sick of it well the, i mean the thing is the, the the thing is that i i'm not opposed to games being like that if the story they're telling is again worth that like if you're going to tell a hundred hour jrpg for example let's use the hundred hours as the 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 stupidly high upper limit of these things um if you're going to tell a hundred hour jrpg if you want me to grind then that's fine but you need to be able to somehow fit a kind of a, a war and peace style style epic <laughs> into that game and let's face it most most games can't do that persona 4 persona 5 sorry the big problem with Persona 5 was it was 100 and even more now because the Royal version adds another 20 hours of content into the bloody thing. So 120 hours for Persona 5, but it's not telling a story that's any more complex, detailed, or interesting than Persona 4, which was maximum 60. So, you know, they've doubled the length of the game but for Matt, don't you no reason. The, the bold man is evil. <laughs> he's evil. He's not but again, a politician. But, but again, as, as we've discussed, perhaps perhaps I'm down on Persona 5 because I max out the one character I really like in the first 20 hours and then the rest of it is just... It's just padding to the end, so... You know, you could have done the Doctor arc. That could have been fun. I, I will say this about Persona 5 Royal, the new one. They, the, the gymnast girl that they've added into it, she doesn't come in until a bit later on and uh, she's great, so... It's a little bit better paced, funnily enough, from my perspective, simply because there's a, suddenly a character that I'm, I'm a little bit more interested in a little bit further on. Yeah, but anyway. All right, shall we, <laughs> anyway, shall we go to music let's, then? Yeah, let's do some music from Persona. <laughs> So, of course, we have a guest on this week, Mr. Philip J. Reed, and he is in the process of releasing his book, Resident Evil, which is not the script of the game Resident Evil, but more of a deconstruction of Resident Evil and the influences upon it. Um, we, you know, we're, we're quite lucky to have this opportunity, of course, and, you know, like, like all good situations, we should use that. So, uh, Philip. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, yes, Matt. <laughs> Got a problem with good the way I <laughs> Good job, Alan. Good job. Yeah, I'm trying really hard, okay? It's, it's a struggle. I'm sorry, Philip. <laughs> it's okay. Use me. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah, so, um, obviously, what was the what was the reasoning behind you know, creating a book about Resident Evil? What made you interested in writing about, you know, a series such as Resident Evil? I will tell you exactly what made me write this book, uh, because he's on the call right now. Mm. Matt, is this ringing any bells? I was going to say, is it me? <laughs> so I was like, <laughs> wow. It's you. Surprise. Hooray. Um, no, Matt and I were talking. Boss Fight Books does a, a, an open pitch period every year or so. Probably, probably not quite a year, but somewhere in that ballpark. And 
I don't remember why, but we were shooting ideas back and forth, Matt and I, and I, I, I wanted to pitch something just for the sake of pitching and nothing was really coming to me. And at some point I, um, resident evil came to me and I don't remember if Matt brought it up or if I brought it to him, but at that point he, uh, he made it very clear that I was either going to pitch this or uh, we wouldn't speak anymore. Uh, so like, I cried wow. a little bit and then wow, I did. Wow, way, way to paint me as a monster. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, that was, I, I don't know. You, um, I don't know how familiar you are with boss fight books, but each one is about a specific game. And sometimes they'll talk about a larger genre or a series branching off of that game. But uh, they're they're very focused, and that's a little intimidating <laughs> because I've played probably hundreds of games in my life easily, and I've loved dozens of them, and I could, you know, speak to, for God knows how long about any number of those. So what what's the game? Because they don't want to hear about a hundred games. What's the game? And I didn't know what it was for me. And Resident Evil ended up being that, of course. But in a really weird way, because I was a Nintendo kid growing up and I didn't have the PlayStation. And the first time I played Resident Evil, it, it kind of scarred me and ruined my life. So it was a really bizarre uh, answer to that question. But once I stumbled on it, I realized there was there was just a lot to say about it, both in terms of what I could bring the, to the discussion and in terms of just what nobody has said, because the game just sort of exists and people parrot what they've heard rather than any research anyone's done so it was a surprisingly open door yeah it's it's a fairly sort of open open playing field i'd say for any sort of critical you know understanding of video games within your published literature um i personally haven't really experienced a lot of it myself so you know, hearing more about it becoming more of a mainstream thing is actually quite interesting. Um, uh, what, when you think about Resident Evil, what do you think in terms of your own personal relationship to the series? Because obviously the way that you're talking about it makes it seem quite personal. What, what is your first initial experience with that series and sort of how, how has it influenced your understanding of it going forward and writing this book, obviously? Yeah, it's uh, that's actually a really good question because um the, the book answers it so uh, there's no brilliant need for me to go into it right now <laughs> buy the book <laughs> no I, that's um it, it is a good question and that is actually where the book starts Be that's actually what happened in my mind i think when i was getting this pitch together um okay resident evil so what is resident evil to me and the answer was it was my first experience with uh a playstation it's a that's a that is a hell of a first experience by the mm. way when you're coming to grips with this controller that seems really foreign to you and also the game doesn't control very well it's a hell of a learning curve um and, and it's extremely difficult so there was all of this piled on uh with the additional fact that it was terrifying to me as a younger lad and uh yeah it was a really emotionally rich experience that i didn't quite enjoy but at the same time i appreciated uh, I saw that the game was doing a lot of things that I didn't want it to do, so I hated it, but it was doing them very well, so begrudgingly, I kind of had to give it a little bit of respect. Um, it's the sort of game that I really only got into later in life when I was willing to engage it on its terms rather than mine, because, you know, its contemporary, for me, would have been something like Mario 64, and... <laughs> That's uh, if I'm approaching extremely Evil, different types of yeah, game. Yeah, <laughs> like that's that's totally on me. If I'm approaching Resident Evil through a Mario 64 lens, I have nobody to blame but myself. And yet, that's where we were. And yet, I was not the only kid doing that. So, uh, yeah, it was actually uh, <laughs> a very formative experience for me. Yeah. Um. Would having you know written this book now, how would you you know contextualize the rest of the series? What do you think about the you know, later games and also the remakes, I guess, because the remakes are obviously more in the sort of public frame at the moment, given, you know, Resi 3 being quite well received mostly, and then Resi 2 being considered one of the best games of the last generation. It feels weird to call the PS4 the last generation. Um, that's, very <laughs> odd. that's so weird. Yeah, how, how would you how would you sort of feel about the the entire series, especially this sort of new attitude to remaking these old games? If you were to see a hypothetical, you know, Resident Evil 1, Remake, remake two. 
it's weird to say that. Oh my god, yeah. They'll do, it. they'll do it. They'll do it. They'll do it. Yeah, they want money. They'll do and it. they'll do it before they do Code Veronica, which oh, is the god. most frustrating they, thing. No, just delete Steve. Just delete Steve from the entire world. He doesn't deserve I'm okay resist. with that. <laughs> but the the rest of that game, though, is that is pretty damn it's good. good. Because it's clad. Um, I like that. <laughs> Yeah, it's it's funny. You mentioned remake, and in terms of Resident Evil, we have experienced relatively recently, within the past two generations, two very different approaches to remaking them. Mm. In the case of the first game, uh, I would I would call that a very like spiritually faithful remake, where so much has changed and uh, uniformly pretty much for the better. But it is very true to what the original 1996 game tried to do and its methods, and it's. It's almost a perfect remake, I would think. I, I can't think of any true reason to, um, you know, I, I can't even think of a way, actually, to sit down and pick it apart and say, here's all the stuff it did wrong. It was very true, I think, to what anyone expected. And then Resident Evil 2 and 3, those remakes, I don't want to say more action-heavy, because that's true, but they misleading. They definitely are. Yeah, yeah they, they are, but like I think it's even, it's beyond that, um, the way that it's they reimagine those thing. games. Yes, thank you. It's uh, it is quite a different tone, and I don't know. I, I find it funny that three, the remake of three, was not as well received as the remake of two, in the sense that that surprised anybody, because the original three is also nothing. did the exact same thing. Like, oh yeah, yeah. Like, compared to two, that it, it doesn't stack up. It's fine. It's not a bad game, but it, it don't kid yourself into thinking that they were um, equal on equal footing back then, because they never were. <laughs> Three was a little weaker, and so the remake was a little weaker. Um, but yeah, I, I definitely find it interesting how the series has evolved. And I'm going to say this, knowing that people have a visceral reaction to this and want to disagree, uh, it, it's evolved in a very successful way. Now, yes. people want to disagree because everybody can point at one of them, whether it's you know four or five or six or seven, and say, but that one sucks. And you know what? That's fine. But the series survived, and it survived through these evolutions. It has made and, a shit ton of yeah. money, <laughs> right? It's they're not they're not my favorites necessarily, you know, five and six, but they were profitable. And I don't know. You take something like Silent Hill, which was maybe true to itself a little longer, but oh, doesn't no. exist anymore. So, <laughs> oh, <laughs> so was yeah, that really the right way to go? So, <clears throat> I'm gonna I'm gonna jump in here. <laughs> Because I, I want to talk to you about horror um, oh. <laughs> as, as a concept. Because, yeah, this, this is something we've discussed on the podcast a bit before, but I'm really keen to get your views since you have now written the book on it. Um, but one of the things that's always kind of stood out for me about Resident Evil is that it's never really, it's never really focused on, on the horror side of things. It has its grotesque elements, I guess. But Sorry, if you look yeah. at the... I would suggest, and perhaps you disagree with me in the book, I don't know, but we'll see when I get a chance to read it. But I would suggest that the original original Resident Evil was more the kind of campy B-grade, kind of almost humorous approach to horror that was inspired by, like, zombie films and whatever. Um, not that all of the zombie films are kind of comedy uh, comedies, but Resident Evil never struck me as a pure horror play. Um and then as the series has gone on, it's melded into that kind of that action-based focus where it has, to the point where the, the recent remakes, Resident Evil 2 and Resident Evil 3, they don't feel to me much like horror at all. Um, they just feel like a kind of a pure action game with a little bit of, a, you know, uh, some, some ugly monsters to shoot rather than military dudes. But when you mentioned Silent Hill, Silent Hill is more, I guess, a, a true horror a, attempt at least <laughs> they're not always successful at it but they, they do try and be genuine horror and sure do you think that that's possibly part of the reason that resident evil has been so enduring whereas silent hill has hasn't because horror is by nature confronting and therefore it's difficult to be a mega kind of blockbuster um whereas <laughs> you know action is a little bit more palatable to a broader range of people 100 percent agreed on all counts except and I'm not disagreeing here but I guess I'm I'm branching off um into the fact that Silent Hill you know certainly 1 and 2 probably also 3 I guess I'd have to look at sales figures but those did manage to be confrontational horrific blockbusters and that is 
such lightning in a bottle. Uh, I, I, I think uh, there's a lot of merit in that distinction. Resident Evil, I would argue, was, was scary as hell, at least for the first game and a little bit into the second and third. Um, but yeah, there was this campiness to it. And it was, <laughs> it was unintentional, but it was there. And it softened the blow. And it does make it more palatable. And people sitting down could be sitting down either because they want to be scared or because they want to laugh. And Resident Evil is going to make both of those people very happy, uh, whereas Silent Hill probably wouldn't. So, yeah, I, I think that that's an, a very interesting distinction. I, I want to agree and say, yeah, that probably is why Silent Hill had a limited shelf life as a series. But, mm, man, it, it, if, anyone, <laughs> <laughs> if anyone could have done it, I think it would have been Silent Hill, and they didn't do it. So you might be right on that. Well, I, I want to sort of also go on this tangent. And it, it depends on when you experience Resident Evil as well. Like when you experience those games for the first time, it, it completely alters how you play them, you know, how you interpret them, if you think they're scary or not. Because I I was actually going to ask this question before, but as someone who's only ever played the remake, I've only ever played the GameCube remake of Resi 1. I cannot go back and play the PS1 version of Resi because it is just hilarious. Like, it's... Not, it is. It looks. It looks shit. To be honest <laughs> with you, like it. Everyone walks around looking like they're made of cardboard. The zombies are like they're mannequins, but if mannequins looked more like Lego, um, <laughs> it, it's one of those things where I I just can't be scared by it, and that's because I you know I just didn't. I've been sort of desensitized to the whole thing, like after playing things like Alien Isolation, like playing Silent Hill Two, like playing. Uh, Lost in Vivo even, um, all those sorts of games that sort of have really sort of torn down what I think is scary and I'm not scared of, you know, just wobbly zombies anymore. <laughs> they, they just exist in their own little area. And it's like, all right, I'm going to run around you and then shout if you touch me because you know, that's, that's, that's the experience I've had having grown up with the sort of later generation of horror games. Um, sure. How, how would you? I mean, you I mean, recommend? sorry, just just to, to to jump in there just quickly because you did mention that you also looked at the films. Did you look at the films of the Resident the Resident Evil films as part of your your look into the the game? I assume you've watched them. Please. I have watched them. Um, oh, I didn't so really. <laughs> they're awful. Well, uh, the I think you said they're awful. They're, the no, reason, they're great masterpieces. The reason that uh, the reason that I bring them up is they I, for me it's actually the way that the the various games have turned been turned into films that kind of epitomizes the very the approach to horror of those things. So, for example, Resident Evil, when you translate the games into the films, and whether you think they did a good job or not is kind of irrelevant to what I'm saying here. But the point is that those films become action kind of campy. Sure grotesque yes there's certainly the the element of the grotesque there but they're not really horror films they're more action-based films especially the later ones whereas you look at what they tried to do with the silent hill films and again you may think they were successful or not i don't know but the silent hill films were definitely trying to be hardcore horror films and oh, i feel like have that have you seen the 3d one matt no i've only seen i've seen the first two the oh, first two silent not, hill films do not see the 3d but, one it is oh there are i don't think i even knew there was a 3d one yeah, it's Silent Hill Revelations 3D. Oh, yeah, it sounds like, great. It's horror. <laughs> do not watch it. Don't do that to yourself. But that also translates. There was another one. I mean, the, the Project Zero, the Fatal Frame, depending on what region you are in the world. Project Zero has a film out in Japan too. And again, it, you, it wasn't particularly successful with the critics and a lot of people didn't think much of it. But again, it was a very genuine attempt at horror because that series is a very genuine attempt at horror. So I just find it interesting that, you know, you could almost look at the parallels between the way that these various games have been tr translated into films compared to the way that the games themselves behave. Um it's always just really interested me that Resident Evil is chalked up as this great example of the horror genre when I don't really think it is as horror a great example of, of horror. Let's because I don't think it was trying to be. It scared the shit out of me when I played it yeah, but first. Do you, think, do, you, do you think it scared us all because we were young when we played it? That's the thing. Yes. Like I, I remember being scared by it in the sense that you know these monsters were jumping through the window and I couldn't turn my dude around fast enough because I was on tank controls. So I got you know et a bit. But that was, that was intense, sure, and it made me jump as a kid. But 
being older and wiser now, I guess, I look back at it and I don't really think that was horror as much as a visceral reaction, if that makes sense. So I'm going to actually go on a bit of a tangent here. So I started playing horror games in second year of college with a friend of mine and we played Amnesia, the first one, like the, the one that everyone says is the scary one. And it scared the shit of us, like the first time we played it. <laughs> it, it was like, you know, we were because we were in college, we were both drunk and also horrified of the entire thing and the Kevin Costner Waterworld monster that appears in the water scared the shit of us. We've now been playing horror games for like, you know, three years and playing them together and we went back and played Amnesia and that game is not frightening at all and it's literally just because we've experienced things like, I know it's it's campy as hell, but Evil Within even being a big, you know, milestone game of genuine fear and then lost in vivo as well which by the way if you haven't played lost in vivo everyone who's listening to this podcast please go play it It is the best horror game in the last 10 years i am going to die on that hill um no pathologic 2 is that's not a horror game that's just oh it's a horror game that's just misery (laughs) it's a horror game no it's It's a horror game via misery yeah okay i'll accept that um (laughs) yeah i have i have a question uh for you phil um do you think that, and this is going to sound like a stupid question, but I think it's actually a, one that's worth talking about a lot. Do you think that Resident Evil is smart? Oh, God, no. No. Um, <laughs> Your right hand comes off? <laughs> I, I don't know. This is, um, I, there's part of me that wants to say no, except, and there's really no way to finish that sentence. I don't think Resident Evil is intelligent. I do think it is effective at various points and whether or not that's intentional is almost irrelevant. I think it's, if it's smart, it's smart in the way that it parcels out its scares and structures certain moments, but by no means am I suggesting that it is an intelligent series. Um, yeah, it's, it is not. It's important. Yet, to know, this is a series that included a tiny Napoleon man as the villain in one of the games. Well, the, and his giant recent, statue that chases you down. His giant statue. The, the reason, the and reason I ask is because, I mean, it it encouraged you to think about a book, right? So, yeah, you, and you know what? You, th- thank you. That's actually the the conversation had turned, and and that's okay. But this sort of leads me back into it. Um, you know. Thinking back on the first Resident Evil, and I, I'm not disagreeing, thinking back on the first one and you picture the the crappy looking polygons and, you know, the, okay, the scary part is that I can't turn around quick enough to shoot this thing. All of that is absolutely valid. And I knew that um, going in to write this book and sitting down to engage with Resident Evil, the first one, for the first time in God knows how many years. And I was prepared to laugh my way through it. And I sort of did. But in addition... Um, there, there was a lot to actually appreciate when looking at it with a critical eye. And that's the sort of thing that at least I forgot. And it seems culturally like we might have forgotten um, that, you know, Resident Evil, it has stuff to offer in in the sense of structuring scares. It's instructive both in what it does right and what it doesn't quite do right. Um, but I went into it thinking, man, I can write this hilarious book just you know ripping resident evil a new one for everything it does wrong and when appropriate i do that but it also did a lot of things uh, a surprising number of things pretty well just uh take this gun it's really good against living things i can't believe we've been talking about this for like 20 minutes now and we haven't once mentioned jill sandwich no we don't need to <laughs> <laughs> you just the book can i ask a serious we'll get into all we, of that we devil <laughs> Can I ask um, but yeah, something more those, serious before we evolve? Those lines, uh, they do get special mention. The Jill sandwich and, you know, it's powerful, especially against living things. All of that wonderful stuff. Uh, <laughs> it does come under the microscope, again, because I wanted to, you know, needle it a little bit where it deserved it. But I was able to um, interview, uh, I'm making sure I'm not forgetting anyone. I think I was able to interview every one of the known voice actors from that game. And I actually got the stories behind those performances, which uh, I don't know. I, I don't want to tell you what to think, but in those interviews, man, I got a whole, a very human story that I did not expect to find behind those voice actors. I just want to know how many takes it took to say Jill Sandwich and not laugh immediately afterwards. And, <laughs> and not like just sort of look down and just like a single tear drip out of the eye. <laughs> He, um, I can assure you he did a lot of crying. 
<laughs> he did a lot of crying. <laughs> uh, no, yeah, like, I, I don't want to talk myself up. Maybe you guys will read the book and hate it, and, you know, you can call me up and make fun of me, and that's fine. But as the writer, at least, I really enjoyed those chapters where I got to talk to the actors and the voice actors and people who actually worked on the game in those unsung capacities. Uh, I shouldn't say unsung, because that implies that, you know, they didn't get any attention. They got plenty of attention. Uh, <laughs> not in any really positive ways. Not in the way they so, expected. <laughs> no. Uh, so it was interesting to kind of give them... Uh, I was going to say give them the microphone, but even that is, you know, they, they had the microphone and that's the problem. So it's just, <laughs> it's interesting to just learn about what happened behind the scenes. Um, Harvard, I'm going to give you the floor and then I'm going to ask a really dumb question. Yep. So I was going to actually bounce off what Alan was saying a bit ago about how, as a modern person, Resident Evil is one of the easiest games to get, right? It's on, like, every platform of the sun. Matt played it on GBC, for God's sakes. Um, Resident Evil Guide that... <laughs> No, no, the actual Resident Evil that. port onto Game Boy. Oh, the, the unreleased one. Yeah, but I've, I've got the ROM, so um, I've, it's pretty much finished. Uh, it was, like, uh, 90% done. That sounds yeah, it like was really close from what I understand. Too. Sorry? How dare you? How dare you be illegal? We don't talk about well, ROMs it, in this. It, it was it was always unreleased, so you know I feel morally uh, you know ex okay with it. And yeah, I played it. It was like ninety percent finished, and it actually works. Like it it's not great, but it works. <laughs> I have seen gameplay of it. It doesn't look good. It's fun. It's kind of fun in, in that they've actually taken Resident Evil and squished it down into this thing in a way that you can still play Resident Evil. Um, it's certainly not you know, a great game, and that's why can, Capcom canned it, but it is interesting to play, and yeah, I do love that. So, back back to you, Harvard. <laughs> oh, yeah, just like, because it sounds like the experience of Resident Evil on the PS1 and in that era was so baked into its context, the kind of emotional response you got really relied on the fact of the technology at the time being like that. And because the game is still so available today, how would you recommend people play it to get the same kind of impacts that maybe it would have had a long time ago? God, yeah, that's a, it's, that's both a very good point and a very good question. I don't know that I can say, well, here's how you do it, and you'll know exactly how I felt when I was you know, a young teen sitting on the floor playing it for the first time. The odds of that happening, I think, are, are pretty slim for anybody at this point. Um, but God, it's Resident Evil is available in so many forms, and yet I have a hard time pointing to one because they're still kind of bad. There was the PS1 classic that came out, and that had Resident Evil Director's Cut, which the, normally the is really good. Music. <laughs> well, no, that's the um, Director's Cut DualShock, and that's the one you get if you buy it on the PlayStation Network. So don't do that, because oh, my God. Um, that's a real game. Good, they released the that. <laughs> good Director's Cut. Yeah, and that's so embarrassing. Uh, the Good Director's Cut was on the PS Classic, which was a good idea, except that the PS Classic has a really terrible emulation. Um, you can get it on... The uh, um, RE1 as well as, as I've heard, which means it runs at a lower frame rate, which is... Uh, I don't know why yeah. they would do that, because it doesn't make sense. Like, the entirety of... <laughs> Running at a 50 hertz, like, it's anything like in 2020 is just astonishing. Th there's no reason, yeah. yeah. It's almost like Resident Evil is cursed. Like, no matter which generation, you know, you, you go back and play it through however many different methods, you, you're going to get kind of a janky experience. Yeah. And, you know, they, they shouldn't want to perpetuate that aspect of its legacy, but they seem to have done that pretty effectively. This is also Capcom, though. We, we have to, like, <laughs> make that very clear. This is Capcom. I think this that's fair. the company who decided that Platinum Games wasn't w worth keeping on staff. So, like... <laughs> yeah, there is that. Yeah. Um, God, it's it's such a good question, because there's so many, like... There, there are ports of it, you know, for the DS, and, um, God, I feel like there's another big port that I'm missing out on. And uh, there's the remake, obviously, but that's not the original experience. So it's it's tough. That's a really good question. If you wanted to get the closest thing to the original Resident Evil experience, even though it's available in dozens of formats right now easily, you'd probably want to get a PS, you know, PS1 or a PS2 that plays PS1 <laughs> games and get the actual disc. And it kind of sucks that that's the answer. I would also double down on the idea that, obviously, drink responsibly, but get yourself to a mental level. <laughs> but you can experience that and be genuinely afraid of it. No, this is like not a joke. This is being genuine. Like, 
that game thrives on you being vulnerable. And if you are afraid of the things in the game, it becomes so much scarier. Even though, oh, yes. like, having played uh, only the remake properly, because I, I did the weirdest way of playing these. I did remake, then I did RE2, uh, Leon's campaign, and then I did RE3 halfway through and got bored, and then went to RE4 and played RE4 for, like, 17,000 times in a row. Now it's your uh, favorite game. Yeah, that's my favorite game of all time. It's fine. Um, I, I would say be in a vulnerable state is how I would best <laughs> say it to play RE4. <laughs> I don't. I don't know how else to say this without saying like just be fucking sloshed. Like, <laughs> like it, it genuinely does help. It made me much more afraid of the game, at least with remake. Um, I'm sure that if I played RE1, I would be in the same boat. Um, yeah, drink twice as much when you do it. But I would love if you do actually go back and engage with that original one. I, I know you said, hey, it won't be as scary, and you're probably right. But I'd still love you to do it, and I'd love to hear what you come away thinking. It is genuinely frightening. If you are in that right frame of mind for it, you have to sort of like build yourself up for it as well and be like, okay, I'm going to be like going through this game. It's going to be spooky at these points. And if you're like sort of in the mood for it, it's actually, yes. it's very, very good in that respect. It's very similar to a movie like, you know, The Descent or um, like any sort of like schlocky sort of, you know, be great horror movie in that regards and that you sort of, if you play along with it, if you really get into it, if you join that sort of vibe that it's pushing, it's actually extremely fun and also horrifying mm. at the same time. Okay. So that's like, I want to start the let's plays back up again. Just do this. Yeah, you should do I'll that. Actually, actually do it. Genuinely do, do, do it. a let's play of the original Resident Evil. That'd be a good one. People love watching that. All right. So, um, by Philip's book is the point. Um, yes. Yes. It, it sounds Good. like it's going to be a great book to read. I'm definitely looking forward to getting through it. So this look, is it available are, right now as we speak? What are the avenues that one can buy your book? Uh, <laughs> depending on when somebody listens to this, the answer will ultimately be anywhere. You know, Amazon, Barnes & Noble, whatever your bookseller of choice is, it will be there. As of right now, uh, it doesn't release until next month. We don't have a specific date yet, but it is with the printers. But as of right now, you can just go to bossfightbooks.com, uh, go to their website, and you can place your pre-order. Is that cool. the way? And it will be available as an e-book directly? too, won't it? Oh, yes, it will. Uh, and that supports you directly? Uh, yeah, I mean... I'm... Good, okay. Use that one. <laughs> Everyone who's just yeah, do that use one. that one. <laughs> All right, so we'll go to some music. I guess we'll have to do some music from Resident Evil, right? Yeah, can we do the RE3 save room music? Is that... You can do whatever music makes you happy. Alan. Oh, that makes me happy. <laughs> no, that makes me very happy. Whatever makes you happy, Alan.
And welcome back, everybody. For some reason, I've taken the microphone off Alan. <laughs> I don't know why. I'm now doing the hosting duties. <laughs> I, I don't know. I think Alan's lost it a bit. Um, it's, for the last it section, is almost 1 a.m. for me. It is, it is very early for Alan and, you know, boy needs his sleep and stuff. So we're going to finish up the podcast this week by quickly talking about our favorite soundtracks of video games because music is good. And uh, it certainly enhances the experience of a game if it's a good soundtrack and it's the kind of music that you like to then buy on CD and or iTunes or whatever and, um, you know, chill out too when you're not playing the video game as well. So let's start with Philip. Philip, what's the favorite soundtrack of yours? It's either going to be Mega Man 2 or Mega Man 9. And I think the answer is Mega Man 9. Oh, that's... Why over two though? Because two has one of the best soundtracks of like the chip tune era, in my opinion. Uh, okay, it does, and that is probably why I'd gravitate there because that's it was natural chip tune. They did it because that's what they had. Whereas nine, it's obviously an artistic choice. Somebody decided here's how we'll present this game and its music. So two is probably the more genuine one. But man, I don't know. Nine is just nine rocks. It's it is the sort of thing I could just drive around listening to, and. Uh, Yes, no apologies for my love of Mega Man 9. The one time I tried to play Mega Man, um, I didn't so much hear the music as I heard an endless stream of swears from me as I was trying to <laughs> play Mega Man and really not doing a very good job of it. So Yeah, but that's only the first 50 or 60 times you play Mega Man. After that, when you actually start to realize what to do, um, it's a lot more fun. The real Dark Souls starts now. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Oh no! It's the it's the Dark Souls of retro platforming. <laughs> it's the Dark Souls of video games. It's the it's the new wave. Yeah. Moving on, Trent, you've been quiet on the last section, so yes. you get to be nice and noisy here. Pick your favorite soundtrack. <laughs> Final okay. Fantasy well, Tactics Advance. <laughs> the soundtrack yeah. of the Snowball Fight scene. <laughs> Well, I, I don't actually remember what that song is. I don't even remember if that was any good. So, no, that is not my pick. Um, and I do like me some good Zelda music, but I like to say things which are recent um, because, you know, recent stuff is in everyone's memories. Um, I really like Gree, uh, Grease. Grease, the, the, the d- digitally the movie. devolved. No, it's Grease. No, the, the... <laughs> devolved a digital game. The, the, the colourful... Dust thing. Yeah, the opera game with a girl. And you jump, jump yeah. around and you... The opera oh. game with the girl? Like Greece? Yeah. Like Greece. Greece. See? See? No, it, I pronounce... So I actually learned. That's actually a Spanish word. So it's meant to say Greece. Greece. Yeah, so I was saying it right. Finish dev. There you go. Yeah. See, you I know right. Every time. Yeah. Right. So, so the reason why I like it, though, is because it's a very... I guess it... It works as both uh, video game music as in, like, I get the sound effects as you're doing stuff in the game, but it also works as a very good standalone soundtrack, and it's very impactful, and as you, in the game itself, as you're collecting things and adding more to the levels, it really is very harmonized to that, so it's a good soundtrack. Yeah, it, that game looks like something that everyone should play. I need to play it personally. Um, that's on my list, actually, at the moment, so... That's going to convince me actually quite a lot to play it. <laughs> right, Alan. Let me know what you do. I have thoughts on that game. I will I'll stream it, probably. Um, I, Matt, you're going to hate me. I'm, I'm going to talk about The Witcher. <laughs> <laughs> why would I hate it's you? Gonna... I don't know why this idea is that I don't like The Witcher. I gave the game the bloody five out of five stars. I like I liked The Witcher. Uh, so, basically... At... For, for those of you who don't know, I have a background in classical music performance. I have a degree in it, even. Um, which means sure. that I can play a tube of metal kind of okay. Um, that's what it amounts to. Um, <laughs> so, I, I had a big interest in folk music and the development of folk music within modern you know, uh, music culture and music as art form, obviously. And the the entire Witcher series is built around taking folk, you know, art and transforming it into a modern comprehension of the concept, I guess. So that whether that comes in the form of, you know, rewriting classical stories, such as the whole Cinderella thing being eaten by a, you know, I forget what the actual story is in terms of what the witcher narrative anyway it's the reinvention of the of the concept 
um, and the music and the score of The Witcher 3 in particular. It happens throughout all three games, but it's the most prominent and also the most sort of like well realized in The Witcher 3. Um, it is it is astonishing how well that is a, a, both like respectfully done and also achieved in a way that you know reaches the modern expectations of it it's not just a single line it's often quite a very complex piece that requires a lot of effort to understand properly and that level of respect that's given to those pieces is for me personally as someone who's interested in the you know continuation of folk music and of folk understanding um it's it's very heartening and it makes me very happy so songs like the fields of ard skellig like that song is based upon a Celtic song called uh, Far. Uh, it's called the Boatman, but it's Firabata, which is about you know, obviously because you know Celtic cultures were mostly boat based. They they, they were around water. It, it's that sort of very very clear link between you know existence and art, and I really really like that as a modern interpretation. I'm also going to like give a quick shout out to civilization six as well, because that has one of the best soundtracks of all time in terms of transferring folk music into a modern setting as well. Um, the fact that it has, you know, all these different versions of the same melody is fantastic. It's so interesting. It's, it's gorgeous. It, it has everything you could ever want in a soundtrack in terms of variety, in terms of instrumentation, in terms of timbre, in terms of feel and soul of different cultures. Um, I'm going to stop talking now because I realize that I'm just blathering on about this stuff. But so, it Alan, quick fantastic. question with your big city folk, um, you know, degrees and stuff about musology. Um, I don't know anything about The Witcher in terms of music except from the Netflix show and Toss a Coin to Your Witcher. Now, that is how not does that... authentic, no. <laughs> that, that not... is <laughs> not authentic. Um, I, but it's I, so I, good. I, no, it's an absolute bop. Don't get me wrong. Like I would must that 100%. Um, the, the difference is, is that that is more of a modern film score sort of thing, at least from... I haven't really analysed it enough to be confident in saying that though so obviously take what i'm saying with a grain of salt um i do intend to go through that um score at some point i just don't know when that'll happen because i need to also annotate it and that's going to take a lot of time as it turns out writing down music takes a lot of time so moving on harvard (laughs) harvard uh uh, i only get one right you get one you Uh, i got two i'm a tutor (laughs) <laughs> okay, I, uh, can I cheat really fast? My shout out is Sayonara Wild Hearts. Yeah. That is a very listenable soundtrack. If you don't play the game, you can just pull it up on YouTube and bump the whole soundtrack. It's very good. It's just a dance album. But my pick is uh, Jet Set Radio. And Jet Set Radio is a game which, depending on who you talk to, is either aged very well or very badly because it's a game about uh, rebelling against disproportionately in uh, extreme police forces. Uh, but it does it in a very comedic way, and it's really grounded in the 90s. And I think the soundtrack is just this mix of hip-hop and really sample-based electronic music. And it's not age in the sense that you know it's a time capsule from the 90s. It's like when you listen to Take On Me and you're like, this is a good song, but it's very clearly from the 80s. I think the soundtrack to Just That Radio puts you into that mindset of being in around those underground music scenes, listening to music that people thought was cool for just a very small period of time in history, and then no one's really making it like that anymore. So, yeah, love that soundtrack. Really excited to see that there's a spiritual sequel coming by the same composer. And, yeah, I play that game all the time. Listen to the soundtrack. It's great. Cool. Um, then, for me, I was actually going to mention Civilization VI. <laughs> I'm so Slightly- sorry. It's a slightly different reason to Alan because Civilization VI for me is all about the different cultures and the fact that each culture has its own music and then as you meet the culture, that music gets implemented into the game. So you kind of have that, yeah, you, you have that experience as the civilization is growing that you the soundtrack also grows. And that's, um, that's a nice touch. I really like that about that game. Um, okay, so I can't do that one because Alan's already mentioned it. Sorry. I will. I'm so I'll, sorry. I will shout out to Mass Effect. I love. Oh. I actually, 
I actually put the Mass Effect soundtrack on the other day. I was doing some work, and I the music is so evocative. It's been years since I last played Mass Effect, but just listening to that music immediately put me back into the the space. And I actually I'm a huge fan of Mass Effect. Um, have fond memories of playing that series, and yeah, the, the it, it's very evocative science fiction music. So that's my shout out. The one I will mention is actually a, a bit of a throwback soundtrack in a in a similar way, I guess, to Harvard's um, Lollipop Chainsaw. <laughs> Stop yeah. rolling your eyes, Alan. Lollipop no, I'm Chainsaw. Past. I'm just like it's it was bound to happen. I should have expected <laughs> <laughs> Lollipop Lollipop Chainsaw, I really wish this game would get some kind of remake or something, but the soundtrack in that game is absolutely incredible. It, it, it the the game itself is that kind of throwback to trashy eighties cheerleader movie, you know, uh, exploitation films. And the soundtrack it just has a kind of a greatest hits that you would expect to go with that kind of <laughs> aesthetic. So it's got, you know, Mickey, obviously, because cheerleader, but it's also got music from Human League, Dead or Alive. It's got it's got a whole bunch of, you know, kind of stuff that we, we like to laugh about now when we hear the music kind of played. But, yeah, it's, it, it's fun. It really adds to the spirit of the game. It's a, a good mix of licensed and original music and... It gives it such a, a high level of energy. The, we don't actually have that many soundtracks that are so heavily licensed as um, the Lollipop Chainsaw was. That soundtrack would be about half and half in terms of licensed music and original music. And you know, when when you jump into a a, a harvester to go rolling around and you know smashing up hundreds of zombies to have um, spin me round, you know, as the soundtrack in the background <laughs> is a lot nice. of fun. Great. It's a lot of fun. Yeah, it's it's a really, really... It, the game is just such high energy, high personality, and they picked the music that's absolutely perfect to go with it. So Lollipop Chainsaw to this day is a soundtrack that I, I, I just think is great. I think the grid game's great. It pisses me off that Goichi Suda just won't remake, remake it or re-release it. Dude does everything else. Like, he's given us another <laughs> goddamn... He's given us another one of those stupid Travers touchdown games, but he won't give us a no, Lollipop Chainsaw. Bastard. No, that does... That game's going to be good. Also, Shadows of the Damned comes first because I want to see the big boner as a weapon. <laughs> the greatest... I like Shadows. Shadows of the Damned is great, but it's that's never going to... Because the skull is called Johnson and he's also your gun and he turns into the <laughs> big boner and it's like... This is not even a joke. It's just saying dick things. It's... Yeah, no. It's, it's, that, it's game is a, that game is an absolutely brilliant homage to kind of... Um, uh, grindhouse, true grindhouse cinema, Stupid and it's, it's it's absolutely amazing. And actually, you know, that actually had Shinji Mikami doing the uh, yeah, on yeah. it as well. So Resident Evil, it's kind of links to Resident Evil that we we're talking about earlier. Um, I was going to say that game will never happen because it's an EA title, published title. But then I realized, you know, Kingdoms of Am Amalur has been remade, so somehow it's not outside the realm of possibility that EA might fob it off to somebody maybe thq will pick it up and republish it or something that'd be neat sure and with that we're going to actually end the podcast right there um thank you all for obviously listening to this thank you to our esteemed guests aka matt harvard trent and philip for exploring his book with us i really appreciate that and i'm sure that the listeners do as well uh, we are going to end up with some final fantasy tactics advance snowball fight music um which i have just <laughs> I hope you know that it took about two seconds worth of Googling to find that. Um, uh, yeah, we'll be listening to that uh, as the final song. Uh, we will see you next month, of course, as we head into September. Isn't that wonderful? All right. Thank you, everyone.